Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity and for allowing us to speak to you this afternoon. Um, like me, I'm sure most of you can't believe that we're at the end of the year. And, and historic is just one of the words I would use. Crazy, bizarre, weird. I'd use all of the above for this year. But luckily, we're getting through it. And thanks to your support, the firm is doing well. And we appreciate everything that we get to partner with uh, with you on um, the, the cases, the legislation, um, all of that is coming through fast and furious. And I know everybody's kind of hanging on, trying to figure out what's next. Um, just as an example, as you know, I'm the managing partner of client relations for Bradford and Barthel, and I've been with the firm for about 23 years. Usually we do about 25 or so um, trainings a year. This year, we managed to put in at least 40 COVID trainings alone, and that didn't include our regular trainings. So it has been a busy year for all of us, I'm sure, and I won't take up more of your time. With that, I'm going to pass it on to, um, I forgot, Tammy, Zane. Don. <laughs> to, to Don's Don. gonna say hi first. Sorry, Don. <laughs> I'm passing it on to you, Don. Oh, to me first. Okay, everybody. Um, no, I, actually, I have nothing to say. I'm not. I'm going to let it go straight to Zane, and then I'm going to take over and talk way, way too much. So let's let's swing on over to Zane right away. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for thank you for joining us. Thanks for being here for uh, this. We've got a lot of good information for you, a lot of good case law updates. But one thing that we did want to go ahead and put right out uh, first and foremost here are the new Cal OSHA regulations that have been put into effect uh, that deal with COVID-19. So these are some new regulations that were being considered by Cal OSHA. Um, while they were in that sort of consideration phase, they decided to go ahead and implement them, put them out out immediately. And this is sort of despite the fact that some of the provisions here and some of the areas that are covered are already in AB 685, which is another law that was passed and was due to be put into effect on January 1st. Cal OSHA wanted things to happen a little bit faster. So as of November 30th, uh, these regulations are now in place. Uh, they do have a lot of specific requirements about reporting COVID-19 claims, prevention of COVID-19 claims, notifications to employees, uh, regulations on testing and when that has to be provided. So we're gonna kind of do a, a brief look through all of these different uh, regulations. And I know there will be questions. Please email those to us so that we can answer them specifically uh, at COVID at BradfordBarthel.com. Also, if you can include the type of employer that it is, will also help us to kind of navigate the regulations a little bit better when answering your questions. So these regulations went into um, effect immediately uh, and they apply to all employers and all employees. Uh, they do specify that there are going to be uh, a few exceptions. Uh, one of the exceptions is if you work from home, these regulations are not going to apply. And also these uh, regulations don't apply if there is one employee that doesn't have contact with other persons. It's interesting that it says other persons because it does seem to have taken into account uh, the fact that individuals at work come in contact with employees, but then they also come in contact with uh, third party vendors, um, some independent contractors, and then of course, members of the public. So if an individual is the only person at work and still comes in contact with members of the public, these regulations are going to apply. So let's get it, let's get into them uh, a little bit and what we're looking at here. And the first set of regulations we're looking at are the notification regulations. And we start off with this new term uh, that has been created called a high risk exposure period. And this is a term of art. Um, and it means it, it's, it's standing for when an individual has begun to develop symptoms of COVID-19. And it kind of gives us a definition and a time frame to look at in order to see when that person would have been uh, contagious. Um, and the time period is defined as two days before symptoms began in an individual and 10 days after those symptoms first began. It kind of creates a 12-day window. Uh, it also states that individuals that don't have any symptoms 
have that same 12 day window, but it's just two days before their COVID test and then 10 days after their COVID test. So those individuals during that time frame are considered to be uh, high risk exposure. Uh, there's a lot of new terms that are being brought in here. Uh, individuals that are ill are now called COVID cases. So you look at a COVID case and whether that COVID case uh, has brought high risk exposure to the uh, other individuals that are working at that particular place of employment. So after you uh, have had that, there needs to be, uh, after there's been a determination that there's been an exposure, you need to look at the communication that's happening with the employees. A lot of these regulations deal with uh, how to communicate that information to the employees that they have been exposed to a COVID case. In addition to uh, informing employees that there's been a COVID case, the employer now has to take steps uh, to determine where that COVID case has been in the workplace, uh, where they were last working, when the symptoms first began, who else they may have had exposure to. And it's gonna require employers to really look at all of the activities of that particular individual and essentially track where they have been during that high risk exposure period. So that will be a little labor intensive for employers to try to track that down and, and determine where that individual has been uh, at all times. Um, in addition to communicating with the uh, employees and timely communicating the existence of a COVID case in the workplace, employers also have to have a method set up for the employees to communicate with the employers uh, because really they want to make this a two-way street. They want the employers to be able to tell the employees there is a COVID case and you may have been exposed, but they also want the employees to be able to tell the employer, hey, it looks like there, there may be some safety lapses here, there's, there's a, a breach and cleaning protocol, and there needs to be a way for that to be communicated. So that is a requirement also that has been put in uh, as well. Employers have to also establish a prevention program. Uh, and that prevention program uh, has to have their policies and what is in place in order to help abate COVID if it does come into the workplace. It has to be in writing and it has to uh, document the steps that will be taken in order to implement that prevention program when there is a COVID case in the workplace. And the question, of course, arises, why are, why are we doing this? Why do we have these additional steps? Um, and the real reason is trying to reduce the number of COVID cases that are in the workplace and the spread of COVID in the workplace. We really do want to try to clamp down on that, try to lower it as much as possible. Um, it's simply good for everyone, the community at large, uh, the employers, the employees, if there are simply fewer cases that exist uh, in the public. So this is why these new regulations are coming into uh, existence. And then we're moving on and looking at uh, prevention and preventing the actual spread of COVID-19 itself. So that does include the communication uh, between the employer and the employees um, about what is going to what is going to take place in terms of uh, is there is there a case, is there not a case, and is there some kind of breach and safety protocol. Um, but there also needs to be some additional steps taken uh, for individuals that are high risk. So employees that are at higher risk of either contracting COVID-19 or more likely they're at high risk of developing severe symptoms. Um, extra steps need to be taken in order to protect those individuals um, if they are at a serious risk of developing uh, secondary conditions once they've been exposed to the virus uh, there there needs to be affirmative steps now in accommodating those individuals uh, to help make sure that they don't have those particular uh, events occur and that, that their exposure actually goes down so you'd be looking at individuals that have underlying medical conditions that make them particularly susceptible to covid uh, issues with weight, high blood pressure, and diabetes seem to be some of the main issues uh, that th that we see with those high risk cases. Um, and then COVID testing uh, is something that is focused on very much in these uh, new regulations, preventing the further spread of COVID by having testing done for the employees at their place of employment and done at no cost. So the access to the testing has to be done during work hours and at the employer expense. Um, it may be beneficial to bring in a third party vendor to do that, depending on the size of the employer. 
Uh, other requirements that have been put in place include face masks and other kind of protective gear. Um, and actually of all these regulations, nearly half of them deal with different preventative ways um, and different protection methods that can be used in order to slow down uh, the spread of COVID-19. So face masks are required uh, and it's required that the employer provide the face masks. Uh, and there are also some very uh, detailed regulations that I know we're going to end up having questions on regarding whether individuals uh, who can't wear a mask in order to do their job must still be required to wear a mask. And the answer is no. Uh, they simply must stay six feet away from other individuals and they have to be tested twice weekly um, if for some reason their job requires them to not wear a mask. Um, so that is a bit of an interesting development and that's something that uh, hadn't been really anticipated before that you might be having a job that you have to do uh, that requires you to not uh, wear a mask. Uh, the mask regulations though also specifically require anyone coming on to the work premises to also be wearing a mask. Um, and this must be communicated to those individuals that are coming on. And that's gonna be your third party vendors, employees from other employers, and also uh, members of the public. So this regulation does essentially require that there be masks, um, a mask requirement put on everyone that comes into the workplace for the purpose of protecting the employees. This was something we really uh, didn't see in the original legislation from SB 1159 related to COVID. There was really no consideration of the public uh, in any way in terms of how they would expose employees to COVID-19. And we thought that there might be some later legislation or regulations to address this. This does appear to be the first regulation to sort of address that large gap and that, that sort of hole that was in that uh, original legislation. Uh, so that is good to see. Um, in, addition, uh, in addition to this, uh, the, the preventative measures that are put in place, there are requirements in terms of how long you have to be out of work um, and away from the workplace before coming back. Um, and we can, uh, we'll look at those in greater detail. I know we'll be looking at those in greater detail next month, but essentially you have to wait 10 days from the date of the onset of symptoms or from the time of testing. Um, and let's go look at some of the reporting requirements now. In terms of reporting requirements, uh, there are requirements regarding reporting cases to the employees. Uh, there has to be a determination that there has been a co positive COVID test for an employee, and that person is therefore a COVID case. And that information then needs to be communicated to the other employees that they would have been in contact with during that high exposure period, that 12 days. So that information needs to be communicated without any identifying information, of course. So no names or any information like that um, uh, being done or being, uh, being passed along. Uh, also, whether or not there are going to be any changes to any of the um, uh, procedures or policies to abate COVID-19, that information also would have to be communicated to the employees. If it looks like you have a policy in place and there seems to be some kind of, of hole in the policy, um, you can maybe make a change to that to try to prevent further cases of COVID from coming into the workplace. And then that new policy has to be communicated um, out to the employees. But then there are also further reporting requirements uh, for the employers uh, in terms of what they are to give to other individuals that are not the employees. So they have to communicate with the health department or they have to communicate uh, themselves with Cal OSHA. So under the uh, reporting and record keeping and access subsections of these regulations, COVID cases have to be reported to the local health department when required, and then they have to be reported to Cal OSHA with a list of very specific information. Employee's name, contact information, occupation, place of employment, the last day that they were in the workplace and the date of their positive test. So all of this information has to be gathered up and this information then does have to be provided to Cal OSHA uh, itself to the health department when needed. And so there are a lot of different records that the employers have to keep. Um, and that makes it a little bit a little bit difficult because the records are never the same. The information that they need to record to send to the employees is different than the information that they send to Cal OSHA. And that is different than the information under SB 1159 that they have to send to their claims administrators. So it is very important to keep that straight, what information is going to what location. Employers are now also required to report outbreaks uh, to 
uh, Cal OSHA, and an outbreak is defined as three cases of COVID-19 within a 14-day period. I'm sure by now we're all very aware that in workers' compensation, an outbreak is four cases within a 14-day period or 4% of the workforce, depending on the circumstances. Uh, so Cal OSHA has an even tighter um, restriction and kind of limitation and definition of what constitutes an outbreak. So when there is an outbreak, all the employees that were in that exposed area, they have to be informed um, and then they have to be tested. They're tested right away and tested again seven days after their initial test. So those are some of the safety measures that have been brought in by this new regulation. Also, this section now defines what is known as a major outbreak, a major outbreak being defined as 20 or more cases at a particular place of employment within a 30-day time period. So we've been looking at a 14-day time period for everything when it comes to COVID, and now we're gonna be looking at a full month, a full 30 days, and if you've got 20 cases, it's considered a major outbreak. Uh, twice a week, testing has to then be provided to the employees. Um, if the health department deems it necessary, that testing may have to be more frequent than simply twice a week. There has to be a determination as to uh, how the outbreak occurred and whether or not the employer has to actually halt operations. So that is something that does actually have to be considered by the employer, and the employer is going to need to uh, have some kind of policy in place to determine, is this a particular situation where I would have to shut down? Um, is this something where I need to close down part of the business, or how do I deal with this major outbreak? But there is that important distinction between an outbreak and a major outbreak in terms of how the employer needs to react and in terms of the testing that needs to then be provided. And since we're talking about testing, let's just go to uh, testing really quick and look at it. Uh, it has to be offered to the employees at no cost when there is that high risk exposure has to be done during work hours. Uh, during an outbreak, employees will retest, as I said before, seven days after their initial tests. Positive tests do have to be documented because they're gonna have to be reported not only to the employees, but they're gonna have to be reported to also to outside agencies. Uh, COVID cases, um, and it seems like this would go without saying, uh, but Cal OSHA said it, so I'll say it, they have to be excluded from the workplace, um, which would which would seem self-obvious. But if someone does test positive, they cannot be in the workplace. Um, there also then needs to be after that further investigation into the risks associated with the workplace and whether there needs to be any kind of update in the safety procedures uh, regarding reducing the risk of exposure to COVID-19. So the testing, testing is very different depending on the type of outbreak that you have, um, and testing will be uh, different depending upon whether or not there even is an outbreak or there is just some exposure. So those regulations have to be looked at closely. Um, but when we go to the next slide, what are we gonna see? We're gonna see some contradictions. We have some contradictions in these regulations. And of course, uh, they're well-intentioned, and at these times things are very complex, and regulations of this nature generally creates some kind of contradiction with other laws or within uh, laws themselves. And this is really the first time that we're asking employers uh, to track a communicable disease through the employee pool in a way that's really kind of never been done before. Um, so there are different reporting requirements, as I uh, said before, under these first three regulations that you will see there, uh, dealing with what information an employer collects, and stores and who they give it to. And it's very important that information that is collected for OSHA not be given out to the other employees or information that is uh, collected also for your workers' compensation claims administrator is not given to other employees or is not given to OSHA. So there, those, those sections are in conflict with each other in terms of what information is gathered. Because at times it says, don't gather an individual's name, and other times you're required to gather an individual's name. So we have to be very careful there, especially with respect to who it is actually transmitted uh, to. Uh, the CDC also states that individuals can uh, return to work after seven days if they have a negative test. These regulations uh, do state something different because they require 10 days for an individual to return. They can be discharged by their doctor, but also specifically an individual cannot be required to have a negative test in order to return to work. I mean, that's specifically stated in the new regulations. So it's a specific amount of time. It's the abatement of symptoms um, and it's releasing, uh, being released by a doctor uh, that deem you no longer to be a COVID case. So there is that determination and it's not simply uh, testing negative. 
And then, of course, the difference in the outbreak requirements between workers' comp and now between OSHA, uh, since the OSHA requirement is stricter. This may actually end up uh, resulting in fewer workers' compensation outbreaks because if stricter uh, guidelines are put in place when an outbreak happens under Cal OSHA and we see that there are different procedures put in place and there's more testing being done, uh, we may find fewer outbreaks in the workers' compensation world because of these stricter uh, Cal OSHA regulations though, um, but that is that is yet to be seen. So we will see how that goes. Um, and so finally, uh, what do we do now? What specifically do employers have to do going forward here with respect to these new regulations. Uh, they have to require screening for COVID symptoms. That can include temperature checks, asking questions regarding uh, possible COVID symptoms or exposure to COVID in the workplace. But once there is a COVID case, employers have an affirmative duty to determine the extent to which the workplace has been exposed. Uh, they have to increase the amount of testing that is available, possibly change their cleaning requirements, uh, determine whether or not there are any other COVID cases amongst other employees. They do have to establish specific policies to keep employees safe and reduce the spread of COVID in the workplace. And the policies are going to be different for every employer because what works for a grocery store and those requirements are going to be different than what works for a manufacturing facility. So this isn't going to be a blanket rule or blanket set of steps that will work for every different employer. It's going to have to be handcrafted um, a little bit, and there's going to have to be a, a little bit, a little bit more nuance put into it there. Um, but testing has to also be provided to exposed employees uh, as outlined, and it might be testing every week or multiple tests done in a particular week. Um, we will be doing a full breakdown of these regulations, what they mean with wonderful things that you uh, will love, like citations uh, to exact code sections. Um, and we'll be doing that at a, at a future webinar. We would encourage you uh, to come back for that. But if you have questions regarding these new Cal OSHA regulations, how they intersect with the workers' compensation world um, and what they mean, please feel free to email us at covid at bradfordbarthel.com. Be happy to get those questions answered for you. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it off now to Don Barthel. Well, thank you, Zane. Um, I wanted to mention a few things before we get started. One, uh, the ta as you can tell from uh, uh, Zane's uh, presentation, our task force, the BNB task force on uh, COVID is very knowledgeable. As Tamina said, we've done dozens of presentations um, dealing with all sorts of cases from soup to nuts, from basic exposures all the way to multiple death claims. So they know the answers. If anybody knows the answers, if you have any questions whatsoever, you definitely want to hit them up. Second, we are not going to be able to complete this presentation. There's so much material. Hopefully it's good material and worth your time. Um, but in the case law portion that I'm going to be doing, uh, to the extent that we don't get through, uh, it's the the, uh, the slides are fairly uh, self-explanatory. Uh, but if you have any questions about those, please email me, and obviously I'll set you up there. Now, I just said we don't have enough time to possibly get through, so of course I'm going to preface because if you know me, I have to preface everything with a joke. So there's a traffic jam and uh, on the on the road, and it's not moving. It's had, nobody's moved for quite a while, and suddenly. There's a knock on this guy's window and he looks out the window and there's this gentleman looking in at him. He says, have you heard the news? What, what, what news? Well, kidnappers are taking all of Congress and they're threatening that if we don't uh, pay them $10 million, they're going to uh, they're going to douse them with gasoline and light it up and, and, and kill them all. Oh, my gosh, says the guy, the driver. What are we doing and what are we what, what's going on? What are we doing? What are we doing? The, the guy outside says, we're taking a collection. We're taking a collection to, to save the day. The, the, the uh, driver says, well, wait a minute. What's what, what's the average uh, donation? Oh, about a gallon of gas. OK, you, you got what you paid for. Let's talk about COVID just a little bit more. Just some COVID numbers so you know how what we're dealing with. Um, in workers' compensation at this point, COVID is uh, making up for about 11% of all of our claims and 42% of the death claims. That shouldn't come as a great surprise. So we want to be ready for that. Over the age of 65, or strike that, over the age of 55, old people like me, 60% um, of the deaths. Um, over half of the exposures deal with public safety or health care workers. So if you're dealing with those kind of folks, you can 
fully expect to see one or two at the very uh, such cases at the very least. Um, uh, then second uh, biggest exposure group are the food related jobs, the folks who are working at those now closed down restaurants and food manufacturers. Courier services, our Amazon folks, et cetera. Uh, there were uh, 2000 uh, cases in October, and November. That seems to be decreased, decreasing with the stay at home orders. So um, you, the beginning, remember the beginning of this year before we were dealing with COVID, the, the big question was uh, all about whether Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and those fat folks were going to be impl considered employees or um, independent contractors. You may remember the, uh, um, the ABC test. And Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and their elk said, we don't think that we, are, we have employees. We want to save lots of money, so we want to we want to continue to treat the people who drive around for us as independent contractors. And there was some legislation that came down and said, no, 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 all your drivers are employees. So Uber and Lyft and DoorDash proposed an alternative bill um, that would, in large part, turn their independent contractors or all their employees independent in country, uh, independent contractors. And they said, and if you uh, legislature in Sacramento don't like our bill, we're gonna put it on the 2020 ballot. And you may recall voting on this if you uh, looked at the propositions on there. They, and they actually um, uh, contributed $90 million, Uber, Lyft and DoorDash, $30 million each, Postmates $10 million and Maple Bear $10 million to fight the good fight and to prove to the good people of California that their drivers should be considered to be independent contractors. Now, Assemblywoman uh, uh, Gonzalez, who had actually sponsored the, trip, the uh, um, legislation that had originally made these people into, uh, employees, had a response to this proposal. She said she didn't. She was not exactly a wallflower. Uh, she said the billionaires who say they can't pay minimum wages to their workers, in short. Uh, and have to treat them as employees. Uh, say they will spend mil tens of millions of dollars to avoid the labor law. Just pay your damn workers. So you can see that each side had gotten their back up against the wall and they were ready for a big fight. So why in the world was there such a big fight here? Why did the big girls and boys that Uber and Lyft say, we're gonna spend $110 million to fight this issue? Well, it's all about the money, of course. Whenever they say it's not about the money, it's all about the money. Um, the, the, the experts in the industry said that they're going to save about 30% of their labor costs by treating their alleged employees as independent contractors. And that's a, that's a lot of rides, that's a lot of food delivery. So Proposition 22, if, if you uh, were following the news, uh, passed this past November, uh, just this last month, and it determined that indeed, that uh, all app-based drivers were going to be treated as independent contractors. It overrides a AB5 um, as it applied to app-based drivers only. So all those other folks that AB5, the ABC test uh, turned into employees, that still applies to them. So what's an app-based driver? It's somebody who provides delivery services on an on-demand basis, through the employee's online enabled application or platform. Sounds like Uber, sounds like Lyft. Or they use a personal vehicle, yep. Prearranged transportation, yep. Online enabled application, yep. Again, Uber, Lyft, um, Uber Eats, etc. cetera. Two, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, and Postmates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I don't know if it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because those are the only folks I've, I think there's one other one I've used. By the way, speaking of which, I, back before, in the pre-COVID days, I was using a Lyft, that was my uh, transportation of choice, uh, two, three, four, five times a, a week. And I took a very unscientific poll of the drivers and said, would you rather be an employee or an independent contractor? And much to my surprise, the vast majority said they wanted to be independent contractors so they could maintain their um, their uh, maintain their schedules or um, have their own independent make their own independent schedules. 
um, they were less worried about the protections that employees um, are entitled to under California and federal law. So I suggested earlier, it wasn't a fair fight. Um, in total, the yes and proposition actually re ended up receiving $202 million to fight the fight. Um, the no uh, folks received $19 million to fight the fight. So um, a, ten a, a multiple of 10, it was, it was pretty much a, a, a given who was going to win this argument. What else did Prop do? Well, what Prop 22 do? Well, they classified drivers as app-based transportation drivers and delivery companies as independent contractors unless, unless the company set the driver's hours. Well, Uber and Lyft don't do that. Required the acceptance of a specific job or uh, ride. Um, obviously, Uber and Lyft don't. Uber and Lyft don't do that. Restricts uh, the uh, uh, independent contractor from working from other companies. Uh, you may see if you if you utilize these companies um, on a if you take an Uber, you often find that they also have a Lyft sign on their dash as well. And uh, workers are not covered by various state employment laws. What else did it do? Um, actually, it entitled the, um, the the folks who work at the for the Uber, Lyfts, et cetera, um, are going to be treated as in, independent contractors, but independent contractor plus. In other words, they're going to be provided additional benefits um, that straight independent contractors are not necessarily receiving. Um, Uber, Lyft, and their ilk agreed to provide a minimum earning level, some health care subsidies, vehicle insurance, um, uh, and it also criminalized the impersonation of drivers, which is kind of important because there have been a lot of attacks giving Uber and Lyft a really bad name. All right, we've talked about AB5, we've talked about COVID a lot. Let's get to the case law. Wait a minute, we're gonna stay with the COVID, but also get into the case law. We had a fact pass pattern here. Uh, by the way, F means fact. I always forget to write out the full name fact, full, full word fact. If you see an F, it means fact. If you see an I, it means issue. If you mean, see H, it means holding. And if you see, uh, see an R, it means reasoning. I'll, I'll try to expressly state, uh, state that each time we go. So here was the fact pattern. Um, it was found that there was negligent supervision and there was an alleged intentional infliction of emotional distress by exposure to COVID. Um, and uh, um, it was argued that the defendant had failed to protect the employees from COVID-19, okay? Nevertheless, it was dismissed. It was found that this, was this would stay within the workers' compensation venue. Um, you can't go to civil court over this, uh, which is a big shh for employers everywhere. They said, although pandemics are uncommon, and let's face it, the last time the United States was impacted by a pandemic was 101 years ago, that doesn't mean the employer's response fell outside the risk of the, that's inherent in the employment relationship. Remember, it's the employment relationship that um, is covered by workers' compensation. That yes, the obligation to provide a safe and helpful workplace is inextricably part of the workers' compensation bargain. All right, here's a big number, and this is a whole lot of fun. And those of you on the defense, and I'm going to presume that most of you are on the defense, are going to love this case. I know I was just giggling through it. Here's a fact pattern. There was a $2.1 million lien file. When was it filed? Uh, more than 18 months after the service was provided. Oops, somebody had a really bad day when they realized what had happened. Um, now, despite that, the, the record contains several pleadings in which the employer referred to the lien. Uh, filed by the labor for the uh, lien claimant. With the question was, is this barred, is this $2.1 million lien barred by the statute of limitations? And the holding was, yes. <laughs> Why? Well, there was no evidence they said that there was proof that the employer knew of the lien claimant's error. There was no latches, there was no unclean hands, there was no gotcha. Um, there was no evidence that the employer in some way, shape, or form through expressly or implicitly waived its defenses or statute of limitations defense. There was no evidence that the employer engaged in conduct that was intentionally setting the lien claimant up to make them think, oh, we must have filed it. Um, there was no indication that the 
employer knew of the lien claimant's error or caused in some way um, to um, um, forego the filing of the lien claimant's reliance. Uh, in short, the employer didn't do anything nasty or naughty, didn't have unclean hands. Therefore, $2.1 million lien just went away. All right, TD for terminated employees. Uh, let's go back to COVID. And the, the holding here, we'll just go right straight to the whole, well, actually, let's go backwards. Here was the facts. The employer was accommodating the employee's temporary work restrictions, and they had done so for a month, and there was no problem. Uh, and then there was a problem. And then there was a problem. Everybody was sent home due to the COVID emergency order. And the question was, well, applicant has now gone home because of the COVID-19 order. They don't get temporary disability, do they? And the answer was, sadly, yes, they do, that the applicant is entitled to DD, TD um, when the employer is required to, by emergency order, to shut down um, COVID-19. Now, that doesn't apply to everything, uh, everybody. It applies only to folks who are on modified duty. And the way to get out of this, from the employer's perspective, is to determine that the employee was terminated for quote unquote good cause. That wasn't the case here. So simply the inability to accommodate the work restrictions did not release the obligation to pay TD. Um, I think this is made clear in another case that I don't have written out in which an applicant, a prisoner, was um, working modified duty. He was released um, um, while still till, still till, I can't speak today still temporarily disabled and at that point the employer it was impossible for the employer to provide modified duty the question was well does the employer now have to pay td we said well that's ridiculous they can't they can't continue to have them work at the prison why would should they be punished and forced to pay pay the td and the answer was tough cookies you continue to pay him td because you're not because you're incapable of providing him the modified duty all right, the Salazar case, a fact pattern. The applicant was offered modified duty, speaking of which, they were unable to perform the work because they were undocumented. We've been probably facing these patterns since, well, since kingdom come. I started workers' compensation about a little over 30 years ago, and there was the very important Del Taco case uh, that dealt with bulk rehab. There's an old, uh, old concept that dealt with exactly this particular type of uh, legal issue. And uh, so we've been dealing with this for at least 30 years, probably more. So going back to the case, the employee was offered modified duty, but they couldn't take those that job because they were undocumented. It was subsequently after the injury determined that they were an illegal worker. Um, and the question was, are they entitled to DTD? Now, given the case law we just went over, you might think the answer was correct, but it was found that no, absolutely not, not under this set of circumstances. They said, um, because of the applicant's inability to work and wage loss is not due to the injury, they're not entitled to the temporary disability. It turns out this is actually a constitutional law question. They said the employer would be deprived of equal protection under the law. That's a constitutional term. If they were required, required to provide more extensive benefits to an employee that's ineligible for employment than would be required to provide an eligible employee. Um, so um, when you're dealing with illegal workers, and that is determined, it's, it's funny how it's all, their, their legal status is always determined after their workers' compensation claim has been filed. Somewhat suspicious situation. But if you're dealing with that, uh, keep this case in mind. All right, the Rome case. Ah, there's Dr. Sigmund Freud. I've got this great Freud, uh, great, uh, Freud joke but I can't tell you because I'll get in trouble with human resources. Anyway, applicants counsel of fact pattern here wanted to attend the psychiatric examination. It was a medical legal examination with uh, his client. And we, the question was, the issue was, was he allowed to do that? And the answer, interestingly, was absolutely not. They said, we've got a CCR on directly on that point or indirectly that says that the applicants counsel can attend any physical examination. Well, physical is not psyche. Psyche is not physical. They said absolutely not. 
And there's actually case law that says neither the absence attorney nor a court report is allowed to be present. Present. So what is an app for a poor applicant to do to protect themselves from a, psyche, a psychiatrist that they or a psychologist for that matter that they th whose activities they think is suspect? Well, they bring a recorder, a tape recorder with them. Anybody who's old enough to re remember those tape recorders? I'm very interested in knowing how many of you remember a reel to reel. I actually, I just turned 58. I am old enough to barely remember reel to reels. For those of you who don't remember anything earlier than CDs, uh, don't talk to me. I think I hate you. All right, Alvarado, back pattern. Um, this is the kind of stuff that actually took place 30 years ago. Back when um, I remember my very first appearance 30 years ago was at the um, Santa Ana board, and there was a case that had been settled by way of CNR for $1,000. With those of you who have been doing this um, too long, remember a Thomas finding, and. So I said $1,000, Thomas finding. That I, I was the one who was supposed to handle the liens. There were 18 lien claimants with liens totaling $100,000. And so a lot of snide things were often said about lien claimants back in the day. I don't think there are a lot of great things that are said now, but a lot of, but it, it got kind of nasty back, back then. And so in this particular hour, but now it's 2020. Um, the, uh, and by the way, all the cases we're dealing with today are from 2020. The judge stated that this lien claimant was, quote, the bottom of the barrel. And uh, the, actually, the judge went on to discredit the billing before even taking a look at, a re look at um, any, of the, uh, any of the available evidence. Uh, it was claimed that he met with the, uh, um, the uh, attorney uh, in chambers and asked him to recuse himself. And the judge said, I don't remember any of this. So the question with question was, is he disqualified? Uh, that is, is the judge disqualified from this case? And the answer to the, or the holding was, was, was yes. The uh, allegations were uncontroverted. And ex parte communication is just always a naughty. You definitely want to, that, that one's, that's the best way to get yourself in trouble, with the, both in terms of um, uh, getting the judge kicked out and in terms of getting yourself sanctioned. They use a reasonable test, a reasonable person test. Now, I love the word reasonable. Um, in law school, they told me that a reasonable, quote unquote, reasonable test was a full employment policy for employers, or for, for attorneys rather, because nobody in their right mind can agree to what is a reasonable is, or no reasonable person can agree what reasonable is with, with others. Anyway, the test is, a reasonable person with knowledge of the facts could entertain doubts concerning the WCJ's impartiality. Well, given this bottom of the barrel comment, it would seem that the judge was not necessarily or could possibly be impartial. How are we doing? How are we, I'm, I can't read that. 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. <laughs> Tammy just came in with a note to show, show me how much time we have left. She put it up. But she put it up backwards. Like she just have got, got a black blank sheet of paper. <laughs> My 58 year old eyes are bad, but I can't uh, real. But uh, I'm not going to worry the fact that I can't see through the paper. All right, credit credit for payment of benefits. Um, you had a bus driver here who had to take a service retirement because of their workers' compensation injury. Um, they were temporarily disabled. And they were also receiving pension pension payments. And the issue here was whether or not um, the employer could take a credit against the pension payments. I think you could probably guess the result here. The answer was no. no. They get the pension payments. They also get the temporary disability award because they were compelled to take the service retirement. And it was due to the workers' compensation claim. Uh, more importantly, uh, to the point I think here in this case, the pension payments are not salary and they certainly are not earnings. So these are com two completely different kind of benefits and um, one cannot be credited against the other either in either direction. All right, SJDBs, SJDBs. Um, we had a naughty applicant here. Um, after he was MMI or PNS, the employer had to term him for sexual harassment. And the question was, they've been naughty, they've taught, been tossed out for good cause, um, um, and the employer can, obviously, the employer's hands were tied. They can't offer model work because 
um, actually they would be getting trouble with civil and with civil court and FIHA and all and all sorts of other folks. Um, the question was, so since they've been naughty, since they can't possibly legally be offered um, mod alt work, are they still entitled to an SJDB? And the answer was sadly, yes. And the holding was, and I'll quote here, absent, modif uh, absent a bona fide offer of regular mod modified or alternative work, regardless of the employer's ability to make such an offer. And that's the secret phrase there, that regardless of the employer's ability to make, a, make such an offer, and regardless of the employee's ability to accept such an offer, the employee is entitled to the voucher. Um, I guess the news is um, there is no there is no easy answer here. Unreasonable delays. Okay, this is a scary one and something that one that you want to keep in mind. Uh, if you're going to face it once every year, once every two years, once every three years, but um, nevertheless, when it happens. You want to you want to take you want to remember the instructions coming from this case. Here's the fact pattern: uh, the applicant was sent a settlement check for fifty-one thousand dollars, and he said, I, "I haven't received it." Well, a little research was done, and it turned out um, on the defense end that perhaps um, yeah, it was sent, but it was believed that he didn't receive it. So, twenty-two late, twenty-two days later, um, it was reissued. And apparently it took two days in the mail to get there, which is not unreasonable. So he received it uh, 29 days after advising that he'd not received it. And the question was, uh, the employer, or the issue was, was the employer's response reasonable? There's that scary word again, reasonable. And was it reasonable? When I was reading the fact pattern, I thought it was wholly reasonable. $51,000, I wanna make darn sure that I'm not sending an applicant $102. But only the fifty-one thousand dollars, fifty-two hundred, wait, one hundred and two thousand dollars, and not and keep it at that fifty-one thousand dollars to which they're really entitled. And the held the hand was held. No, that was unreasonable. Twenty-nine days was just not fast enough. They said, sure, you're entitled to confirm, um, talk to the bank, confirm that the check, um, the status of the check. Um, but you've got to do so diligently. Once again, I thought 22 days was diligent. It's apparently not. It should be corrected, quote unquote, promptly. I thought 22 days was promptly. Apparently it is not. Um, and also there has to be a satisfactory, quote unquote, satisfactory um, explanation as to why it took 29 days. I think that was really the problem here. I think it could have been very, fairly simple to get the 22 get the judge to accept the 22 days or 29 days so long as we had some sort of exp explanation i think the defense probably fell fell down on the job here and didn't have a, have to come up with an explanation just we're sorry um the real painful thing here is there's of course a 10 percent penalty for applicants attorney in this case um 32 3200 dollars so that 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 really hurts Serious and willful, we don't have to deal with a lot of those. And thankfully, we know that they're worth a whole lot of money. Um, but we also know that when we do, we typically, we tend to lose, well, let me rephrase that. Applicant gets all the benefits of the doubt when it comes to um, you know, the case in chief. And I think the employers tend to get the uh, benefit of the doubt when it comes to 132As and serious and willful claims. So let's see if the employer um, got the benefit of the doubt and succeeded in this particular case. The fact pattern here was we had a prison guard, uh, or some prison guards rather, that were attacked by gang members, okay? Um, the associate warden and the captain didn't issue a memo with of a warning that the inmates were planning an attack on staff. Uh, I hate that fact pattern. The witnesses said they should have done so. They should have triggered, it should have triggered an investigation. They should have had a lockdown. They should have searched the cells. Uh, you can see where this is going. SW, absolutely. And the District Court of Appeal denied it. They said that it, although this was a mere, this was a more than a mere passive failure to act. And remember that a mere failure, uh, mere passive fail to act, failure to act probably is not going to be a found to be um, an S and W. But uh, there were, there were, there were actual rules that the employer would needed to follow their own internal rules that they needed to follow and they failed to do so. 
that's uh, there's case law on point with that 132 A's as well. If the employer has their own certain rules as how to investigate something and don't follow them or doesn't follow them, then um, there's much more likely that to be a finding of a 132A. There's a case regarding uh, Southwest Airlines directly on point. All right, the medical legal process, I think we're gonna skip that. And interpreters, um, interesting little case here. Fact pattern, the interpreter did what interpreters do and then interpreted, but later on it was determined by the court that there was no employee, employee or employment relationship. Well, the question was, the issue was, are they entitled to um, reimbursement? I think the labor code says no. Uh, the WCAB said yes. Let's see why. They said that 5811 says interpreter fees that are reasonably actually necessarily incurred must be paid by the employer. Wait a minute. We've determined there is no employer. This case makes no sense. The, they said, we're not going to define employer as somebody who actually hired and employed somebody. We're going to define an employer as somebody who it was claimed was the employer. That's crazy. Um, and they said, and they it continued, their, their rationalization was awfully weak. They said, if they held otherwise, it would be tough for us to get interpreters. Do you really believe that? If you go down to the board, you can't help but trip, turn around and trip over interpreter. There are plenty of interpreters, um, but uh, um, nevertheless, this was the logic, this was the rationale that the WCAB um, applied. Law enforcement do-gooders. Um, did you know, this is just sort of a fascinating situation. I, I, I wasn't aware of this. We had a couple of civilians responding to an officer's request to a 911 help. The officer didn't indicate what it was. They just said, I need help. And two civilians jumped up and said, we're gonna help you. Um, and they got injured, of course. So they filed a civil claim. And they said that the, that the employer, this alleged employer, then the officer should have warned them of the dangers. Kind of tough to think that the, that the officers even necessarily going to know what the, all the dangers are at that point. But nevertheless, the question was, can they go to civil court and get out of workers' compensation? And the answer was no. This is actually a workers' compensation issue. Uh, and there is labor codes provision directly on point. Anybody helping a quote-unquote active law enforcement uh, service um, or providing active law enforcement service at the request of an officer is an employee of the public entity. Um, all right, let's skip on that, that one. I want to get to at least one more. How are we doing on time? Well, we can do a couple more. Um, a going and coming rule. We always lose on the stinking come, going and coming rule because there are there are more exceptions to the going and coming rule than uh, there are holes in Swiss cheese, I would like to say. Um, guess what? Here's when we actually won. The applicant goes across the street to their parking lot, across the street from work to the parking lot, gets, assa gets assaulted and robbed. And the question was, um, issue was, is this um, compensable? And it was held, no, it wasn't. They said this occurred during the regular commute hours. Well, there's, that's, that's going to coming rule. And that there was no special risk that this, uh, that she could have been robbed just like any uh, other person who parked in this parking lot. Now, I think that the defense did a really good job, or more, so, more importantly, that Afghan's counsel did a poor job because they should have been underscoring the fact that the employer held, that there was only one parking place that the employers that the employees uh, that the employers provided, or that was within um, uh, reasonable distance from the employer's place of business that the uh, employee could have utilized. All right, um, one last case, and then and then I'll let you go and wish you happy holidays. The Friar case. Um, there were two awards in this particular case for a perm total. Um, there was a, a finding of loss of eyes or the sight thereof under Labor Code Section 4662. Remember, Labor Code Section 4662 says that you're going to be assumed, not presumed, you're presumptively, conclusively presumed in other words, you can't you can't rebut it. Defense, stop arguing. It's just going to happen. It doesn't matter what the permanent disability rating schedule says. It doesn't matter what the AMA guides say. 
the applicant who ha is going to be 100% perm total if they've lost both eyes or sight thereof, both hands or the use thereof, are practically to suffer from practically total paralysis, paral paralysis, that is, are sitting in a wheelchair and have problems with their upper extremities, or four, are suffering from permanent mental incapacity. All right, so um, in all other cases, it shall be determined in accordance with the fact. We've had lots of case law about that. So in this particular situation, uh, we had this person who was blind, taught law, and as a result, they were, well, even the AME said they were legally blind. Uh, but it was, the AME apportioned it out, said uh, it was 30% as the result of two specifics, and uh, three per each specific, and 40% uh, non-AOE, COE. And the question was, or the judge said, well, there can't be apportionment because they're legally um, uh, presumed 100% perm total, and that's, it can't be rebutted. So if, you can only, if it can't be rebutted, if you, when, you when you've lost both eyes, when you're blind, um, there can't be apportionment, right? And there's case law, there was case law to support the doctor or the judges um, failing to provide apportionment. And, but the WCIB said, no, as a matter of fact, we do, do get to apportion this case. They said Labor Code Section 4663 and 4664 provides for apportionment where there is apportionment, where there are non-industrial um, uh, contributions to the permanent disability. We always get apportionment if there are uh, a non-AOE, COE uh, causes of permanent disability. Even this conclusive presumption um, doesn't well, it stands, well, if you're legally blind, you are 100% under Labor Code Section 4662. Um, there's still, there's one way of attacking it, and that's apportionment, which is, which is great news because the case law previously had been totally problematic. It, it had really had said if they're 100% under 4662, the eyes, the hands, the practical paralysis, the brain damage, the total brain damage, um, there was nothing left to do, just beep, 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 back up the money truck, and they get their 100% perm total. Um, that's no longer the case. It's now time for us to do legal research, factual research, take depositions, um, subpoena records to get the, to see if we can get that apportionment. And Lord knows, all we need is 1%. Remember, I'm your hero if I take one, your 100% perm total disability and take it down 1%. Um, I think. We have run, let me check, just check that. Oh, we have got one more minute. So I'm, uh, oh, I'll just make one more point. And I think uh, this is very important. And I'm just going to read this, but it was a re really good argument. Here's one of the rationalizations for the WCAB. They said, the dissent has said, no, 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 they should, there should be no apportionment. Uh, the majority said, under the dissent's interpretation, an employer who hired an employee with a pre-existing loss of use of an arm or one eye would be liable for the employee's 100% perm total if the workplace injury caused the loss of use of the other arm or the other eye. What's the point? The point is who in their right mind would hire somebody with one eye or with one arm or in a wheelchair uh, when, when one small injury to one other eye or to the other hand, et cetera, um, um, that doesn't that would on its own not be 100% leaves the employer to be liable for a perm total. Perm total. Um, I, I think the employers would probably be well advised to avoid that. This case um, um, takes care of that problem. All right, it's uh, exactly one o'clock. So before I swing over to Tammy, I'm going to tell you that I really hope you have a wonderful, safe holiday. I hope you're able to get together with at least your immediate family. And, and and have a wonderful holiday. And I hope Santa Claus is good to everybody. Happy holidays again, you guys. Take care. Take care.